Well, welcome. Thank you everyone for uh, joining the Watershed Council for one of our icebreaker series. Um, you actually have four speakers today. <laughs> so this is a joint presentation by the Watershed Council and Freshwater Future. Um, so let's go through introductions. Um, I'm Jennifer McKay. I'm the policy director here at the Watershed Council. And so my role is working in D.C. and Lansing trying to get our elected officials to actually um, get some policies and legislation in place uh, with respect to PFAS. Um, so I'm Dave Edwards. I'm also at Tip of the Met Watershed Council here. I'm the monitoring and research director. So I do a lot of the field work, getting out there in the lakes and collecting water samples and sending them to the lab. Yep, and then I'm Kate Hogan. I'm with Freshwater Future. Uh, I work in the lab at the U of M Biological Station where I run the drinking water samples and incoming surface water samples for PFAS. Excellent, and hi, I'm Ann Bauman. I'm with Freshwater Future. I'm Associate Director there. I mostly help with everything, fundraising, <laughs> uh, issue work, uh, a lot of work with community engagement throughout the Great Lakes Basin to help communities protect their water. Do you have a, quite a All crew right. here today to <laughs> talk to you? Um, so today we're going to walk through sort of PFAS 101, what are they, um, how are you exposed to them, what is the risk and sort of the health impacts. We're going to talk about what the federal government and state governments are doing to address the risk of PFAS here in Michigan. Uh, some key opportunities that we're working on moving forward and then we're going to talk about what the Watershed Council and Freshwater Future are doing here locally with respect to drinking water and surface water and PFAS and how we're trying to take an active role uh, to address the issue here locally. So what are PFAS? They are man-made chemicals. Very simply, there are about 4,000 different PFAS um, so when we say PFAS, it's actually a chemical class of them. Um, I'm not going to try and name them all. Uh, they were actually um, created in the 1930s. They came into popularity in the 1950s, um, worldwide use. And it really was products for our convenience. So non-stick pans, Teflon, um, not, or water-resistant clothing, the Gore-Tex, stain-resistant, um, carpeting and shoes, uh, cleaning products, paints, varnishes, firefighting foam that's used all over the country, chrome plating. The product is pervasive and pretty much used in products every day. So if you think about it, you know, the pans you use, how many of you have eaten pizza, <laughs> gotten takeout from Chinese, had microwave popcorn, how many wore a coat today that probably is water resistant. These chemicals are used quite frequently and subsequently they are in the environment all over. Um, I will say the two most commonly used PFAS, which are the ones that we'll talk about in most, it's PFOA and PFOAs, um, those were voluntarily taken out of production in the United States a while back. However, they're still produced elsewhere in the globe and they're also then imported into the United States. So that we're still um, in influenced by them. So while they don't occur naturally, they're everywhere in the environment. Um, and they are found in people, wildlife, and fish. Uh, if we tested all of our blood, all of us would have PFAS in our blood right now. Um, it's just a matter of what that level is and if it's caused harm at all. Um, the problem with PFAS is they don't break down in the environment. So they're resistant to thermal, chemical, and biological degradation. Um, so essentially, they're considered the forever chemical because they last forever. Um, they also bioaccumulate, so the levels start to get greater as they go up the food chain. So at the top of the food chain, they're greater in humans than they are um, in the other species. How do they get into our environment? Um, a number of ways. 
So they get directly into the water sources from industry. So whether it's being um, produced in a, a chrome plating facility or a paper facility that directly discharges into the water, uh, a wastewater treatment plant directly discharges into water. Um, they also, our wastewater treatment plant produces what's called sludge as part of the process. That is land applied generally to farms. Then that gets taken up into the groundwater or into the plants. Um, and additionally, when we throw away these products, it goes to a landfill that creates what's called a leachate that gets into the groundwater or goes back to the wastewater treatment plant. So essentially there's a number of different ways in which these products all get into our water resources. And then our exposure primarily comes through drinking water, whether it's municipal water or residential wells. Um, ingestion is another way, whether you're eating contaminated fish or wildlife. Um, ingestion can also be through some of those uh, food that's contained in products that have PFAS. So the popcorn, uh, the takeout containers. Um, in addition, there is some um, soil and dust ingestion. Uh, that's primarily a concern for younger kids that generally have more activity with hand to mouth. <laughs> um, so um, that's a concern. Um, using the consumer products can be a pathway of exposure, although relatively low compared to drinking water. That really is the greatest concern. Um, the consumer products is of greatest concern to those that actually manufacture them and work in the facilities where they're produced. The health impacts, uh, there's a lot of research that um, still needs to go on. A lot of research is underway. But what we do know is that PFAS can cause changes to thyroid and liver function. It can cause high cholesterol. It can cause ulcer ulcerative colitis, excuse me. It can cause certain types of cancer, particularly testicular and kidney cancer. It can change uh, hormones in the immune system. Um, when individuals are exposed to PFAS prenatally, uh, they experience a decreased birth weight and they also have a decreased vaccine response. So the vaccines actually don't work on them. Um, and additionally, if they're exposed prenatally, the young women tend to be obese and young men tend to have a low sperm count. Um, and again, we're just starting the research on the health impacts, and this is what we know so far. So the federal government, what they've done, they've developed a health criterion. Um, it's a lifetime health advisory level of 70 parts per trillion. Just so you know what 70 parts per trillion is, it's one drop in 20 Olympic <coughs> swimming pools. So that's a part per trillion. Um, so for two of the 4,000 PFAS. So only two, and it's 70 parts either individually or combined. This is not enforceable. This is not a drinking water standard. This is just a recommended advisory level. Um, they issued recently a action plan for PFAS nationwide, um, really, in my opinion and most people's opinion, it was a non-action plan. Um, it basically said, in a year we'll consider doing a maximum contaminant level for PFAS, which would be a regulated drinking water level. Um, so they kicked the can for a year. Um, in the meantime, they're just going to work on monitoring and focus on getting a better understanding of PFAS and educating the public about what they are. In last year, um, there was a law passed by our 
senator um, pushed it through, Senator Peters, that actually allows airports to no longer be required to use firefighting foam that had PFAS. Previously, the FAA required airports to use firefighting foam with PFAS in it. Um, there's been some states that have gone above and beyond. Washington banned the use of PFAS and firefighting foam, so this now allows states like that to move towards not using it in firefighting foam at airports. It doesn't require that they go away from PFAS and firefighting foam, it just allows them to not use it. And then there's a Congressional PFAS Task Force that's been formed, and actually our um, representative Jack Bergman is on it. Um, there's introduced legislation. Um, our members of Congress from Michigan are on all of these. <laughs> um, as you can imagine, given what we've seen in Michigan, um, there's a PFAS Accountability Act, which basically would require federal agencies to work with states um, if the governor asks. This is stemming from some of our military sites here in Michigan. The fact that Michigan has told them what we want them to do and the military's response has been no. Um, the PFAS Detection Act is uh, 45 million to do a nationwide study on PFAS um, to figure out the extent of PFAS contamination um, nationwide. And then the PFAS Action Act would require um, all PFAS, the entire chemical class, all 4,000 chemicals, to be listed as hazardous substance under Superfund. This would give the EPA the ability to step in and help with cleanup, go after liable parties, um, to make them help pay for cleanups. So this would be significant if we can get this through. The state of Michigan um, has actually been a leader across the country stepping up. They created a Michigan PFAS Action Response Team. It was uh, head of all the agencies, so the DEQ, um, the fire marshal, all the key agencies um, to basically work together on how to address the emergency that we've seen with drinking water in Michigan. They're investigating um, sites across the state. They've identified to date 43 um, confirmed sites of PFAS contamination. They launched an initiative with wastewater treatment plants to see if they are discharging PFAS into our surface waters, and if they are, trying to work with them to identify the source so it can either be reduced or eliminated. Um, this has been huge down at the Huron River um, downstate. And they're testing fish and deer for PFAS. Uh, they do now in the, if anyone gets the Eat Safe Fish, it's a Michigan guidebook that they put out with mercury and other contaminants. Now PFAS are listed in that, so you can see um, that. And deer, they've only had one advisory for deer. Um, it was near the one of the military sites. So here are all the um, confirmed sites that are being investigated and currently dealt with. They're primarily sites um, the, where PFAS are known to be used by the industry. So it's at military installations, airports, fire departments, plating operations, landfills. Um, so right now in Northern Michigan, we currently don't have any identified. <coughs> uh, Michigan also created a drinking water standard. They based it uh, on the EPA's uh, advisory level of 70 parts per trillion. That became effective in January of 2018 for, again, the two chemicals, so two out of 4,000, but it's the two most common, PFOA and PFOAs. Um, this provides a tool to mandate enforcement action, essentially. Um, they've tested all public water systems and 461 schools. Um, out of that, 90% came back non-detect. 3% um, came back between 10 parts per trillion and 70 parts per trillion. But that 3% 
is 1.5 million people in Michigan are drinking contaminated water. Um, that? Where is that? There's multiple sources across the state. Um, there were only two sites that were over the 70 parts per trillion. That was the Rockford, um, the um, or the city of Parchment, I'm sorry. So the city of Parchment was put on the Kalamazoo municipal water um, to provide that and a school, um, an elementary school. So the state of Michigan provided uh, alternative sources of water for those two. Up here, um, Emmett, Sheboygan, and Antrim County, the testing were all non-detect. However, Charlevoix County had three areas that were positive. Uh, the city of Charlevoix had levels of PFOA and PFOS between two and four parts per trillion. Wallen Lake water system, which is in the village of Wallen Lake, um, was not attacked for the two, the PFOA and PFOS, but actually came back positive for other PFOS um, between two and 19 parts per trillion. Again, there's no advisory level or criteria for those PFAS. And then Boyne Falls Public School came back at seven parts per trillion. Because all of these are below the 70 parts per trillion or they're not regulated because they're not the two that have um, a criteria, nothing is being done about all of these. Um, they're just going to be continually watched and monitored. So the state of Michigan uh, administrative actions, the governor recently reorganized the DEQ. As part of that, she has made that MPART, the response team permanent and part of the DEQ. There's uh, money for groundwater mapping with a focus on PFAS that came in a supplemental budget bill in the lame duck. We got 4.7 million. There's 30 million for remediation and PFAS and public water supplies. Essentially what they're doing is any of those residents that are, have PFAS or drinking PFAS contaminated water, they're going to be hooking them up to municipal supplies and they're going to be providing municipal supplies with treatment technologies to address the PFAS. And then we have budget recommendations that just came out by the governor um, that will have 15 million to, again, go to PFAS contaminated sites to try and clean them up. And 13.9 is going to the Department of Human Health and Services to try and look at some of the health impacts associated with uh, PFAS. And we're trying to get more clarity on what the 13.9 would actually do. We're not quite sure. Other administrative actions is trying to get a more holistic look at PFAS, um, looking at food and biosolids and land application. So with the land application, it's often put on agricultural fields. So looking at do we need to ban that practice or do we need to set limits for the soil? Um, we know it gets taken up by the plants. Um, if it gets taken up by the plants and it's food for us, does there need to be a limit in the food? If so, what does that limit need to be? Likewise, if it's um, you know a field used for cows, if the cows are eating in the field, what is the levels then in the cows? And if they're used for milk, what is the level in in the milk that goes to us or what is the level that's allowed in the beef that goes to us. So there's a whole host of um, parameters that have to be sorted out between the federal and the state government and a lot of research still needs to be done to figure out how all of this interacts and comes together. Um, legislatively, last session, um, there's only <coughs> eight labs that test for PFAS and none of them are in Michigan. <laughs> um, so Michigan worked on getting a lab here, uh, well not up here, but in Michigan where we could do our own sampling and testing um, to try and expedite the process. 
and funding obviously for monitoring that we've done throughout the states. Multiple bills were introduced, but no action ended up being taken other than funding. This year, um, a bill has been introduced by um, uh, uh, Representative Brinks to set a drinking water level to five parts per trillion. So to take it from 70 down to five. Um, there is evidence, science, that the 70 parts per trillion is not safe, that we had the health impact start prior to 70, but what we don't have is at what level they do start at. So we can't say the health impacts start at five or 10 or 15, but we do know they start below 70. Um, there's moves to address the firefighting foam, um, to ban training with the foam that contains PFAS, um, and to try and do a take back program, and we expect more legislation to come. So some opportunities we have, we can do emergency rule um, based upon the contamination we know and the health impacts we know. So that would be valid for six months. It can be renewed for six months. The governor can do that at any time. Uh, the administration could also undertake rulemaking to set a drinking water standard lower if she wanted. The DEQ could work on a lower standard. However, in lame duck, there was a bill passed that um, now means it would be subject to what's called an enhanced review process. Um, and so the DEQ would have to come up with a significant evidence um, to support the lower number. Uh, I think the evidence is there, but it's, it's definitely an, an added process that the DEQ will have to go through. Other things we're now looking at are also procurement policies. So trying to get the state to only purchase um, furniture and carpet and food products that do not contain PFAS. Um, a take back program for all of our firefighting departments for the foam that is still out there. Um, industrial pretreatment, making you know the producers actually treat for the PFAS rather than putting the onus on the wastewater treatment plants. Um, or developing a polluter pay program. Again, making the companies <laughs> that are using the chemicals um, pay for the program rather than it coming upon uh, the taxpayers of Michigan. And that's it. Great, thanks. So I thought we might start telling you a little bit more about Freshwater Future uh, and then talk a little bit more about what we're doing with PFAS with the Watershed Council. So actually, uh, Freshwater Future started uh, here at Tip of the Mitt Watershed Council. It used to be the Great Lakes Aquatic Habitat Network and Fund. And it was, the purpose of it at that time was to help citizen advocates all around the Great Lakes Basin uh, do the type of work that the Watershed Council does here. You know, people would call and say, can you help us protect our wetland in Wisconsin or Minnesota or Ontario? And the Watershed Council couldn't do that. They had their geographic area. So they started the Great Lakes Aquatic Habitat Network and Fund to give resources to those other organizations around the basin to protect the water so that all of our waters in the Great Lakes Basin could be healthy. And so uh, Freshwater Future spun off uh, in 2006. Uh, and so we continue to help citizen groups around the Great Lakes Basin to protect their resources. Uh, so that's just, a, I think, you know, appreciation of uh, the Watershed Council's role in going beyond just their geographic area and seeing the benefits of protecting resources within the Great Lakes Basin. So we're real appreciative of that. Uh, so with PFAS, I think Jen did a great job of kind of reviewing uh, all the, the threats and the problems that are out there. Uh, as this started to arise, you know, one of the things that we were concerned about was getting people access to information about the quality of their water. And how could we help people to uh, test their water? We've done a lot of work in Flint, so we saw the trouble that the Flint residents had in getting their water tested for lead. They didn't trust the state laboratory uh, because the state had told them they were fine to drink it, right, when it actually was not safe to drink. So we knew that this type of problem would probably arise with PFAS, and it has. You know, on Rockford already, the DEQ is saying if 
If you don't have uh, 70, then it's not, it's not at their concern, right? Because they are only concerned about 70 parts per trillion right now. But we're looking at the research where it's showing that actually lower amounts might be harmful. And so we think people should be able to have their water tested, have access to that information, and make decisions on their own to protect the public health and their family's health. So with that, we really decided it was important to figure out uh, how to offer a low-cost test. Uh, we've been working with uh, Tim Viverica at the University of Michigan Biological Station uh, with the lead monitoring in Flint. So we asked him, can we do this? Can we do something affordable? You know, the test to get it done at one of those private labs, and there's a couple in Michigan that are doing it now, but they're charging $300 to $350. You know, a lot of people can't afford that. And he said, yes, we can do it. So we trusted him. Uh, he helped, uh, we raised money, uh, so Freshwater Future said we'll find the money to buy the equipment to do the testing, and uh, with that, uh, then we were able to hire Kate. So I'm just really going to let Kate talk more because she is the chemist. So she understands PFAS and a lot of the things around it, but then we'll talk a little bit more about uh, how that drinking water testing is going to work, uh, how we're going to work with the Watershed Council as well, and then a little bit more about some of the education awareness and policy work we want to um, do together as well. So Kay, I think I'm going to pass it to you. Okay. We'll switch. Over here. All right, so I'm going to start off with just talking about um, a little bit of the chemistry behind um, PFAS. So I like to break it down into two. We have our long chains and we have our short chains. And long chain PFAS include PFOA and PFOS. And these are the persistent chemicals that have the most research right now. Um, and they are bio bioaccumulative, but they can also be filtered the uh, carbon filters and reverse osmosis, so there's kind of some hope there. Um, but in addition, we have short chain PFAS. And when I say chain, I'm referring to the carbon chain at the end of a carboxylic acid. So whether there's eight or four carbons is kind of how we determine the difference. Um, and these are really mobile in the soil and water, so they're going to spread out far from their point source. Um, and we cannot filter them effectively via carbon filters. Um, it's kind of sporadic whether they get caught in them. So they're a huge concern, and um, there's not a lot of research on them. So that's we don't know the health effects necessarily, and they aren't regulated. Um, I think Jen did a really great job on going over kind of how PFAS became a problem starting in the 30s and worked their way into our homes and then around the 80s we started to realize they were uh, persistent and they were bad for our health. Um, but mostly we want to talk about the drinking water testing program that is available. So it's available for $60 um, and that is quite a bit down from the $300 that it usually runs. Um, Tim has a very can-do attitude about it so we just kind of <laughs> got everything together and we made it happen. And um, we are looking at 14 different PFAS compounds when we do this analysis. So that includes the PFOA and PFOS, but we also will report uh, the other PFAS found. And a lot of times it can be over 70 once you look at those. Um, PFOA and PFOS are the primary contributors because they were produced so much between 50s, 60s, 70s, um, and they're persistent. But the other ones have similar health effects, we're thinking, because they do have a similar structure. Um, so we will analyze any samples that are sent to us at the U of M Biological Station. Um, it takes about three weeks for them to go through the full process. They start with a an extraction, we have to concentrate them down because one drop in 20 Olympic-sized pools is really hard to see, even 
with our equipment um, so we are able to concentrate it down and that allows us to quantify them um, but there are limitations still so as the limits the proposed limits to PFAS become lower and lower it gets harder to identify them within the samples so um, we need progress also on the scientific front of uh, how do we quantify them below one PPT or below a half of a part per trillion. Um, and we do follow the EPA method that um, the DEQ follows as well, um, although we are not certified. So should you find high levels within the samples, a certified lab would be able to then verify that and um, you can take action on that. So um, I was just going to add, actually we've already done, Kate just finished some of our first set of samples already. Yes. And uh, mine came back with 11.8 uh, PFAS. So I live um, across the street from Burt Lake on Chickagami Trail. So if anyone knows where Maple Bay is, um, I am in an old farmhouse, or the AIDS farmhouse that worked at Chick Lather's farm. But uh, there's really not much around me. Right. So thinking about where did that come from, uh, you know, it, it's concerning. And I'll be honest, I thought mine was going to come back good. Uh, we had family member, or other my staff coworkers has family in Muskegon. They, we were pretty sure theirs were going to come back high, and they did. <laughs> so I thought, okay, I'm going to be good, right? But I'm not. So you know, last night I stopped and bought my bottled water and took it home and I'll have Kate run another sample um, this week just to see as well um, so we can confirm it again. But I think that's the, the problem we're seeing is they're, they're showing up everywhere. These chemicals are so right. ubiquitous that we're going to find them in places we didn't really expect them. And even though the government's telling us that there's the safe level, we really don't feel that that is safe. So we really wanted people to have this precautionary principle that you should be a safe, take care of yourself as much as possible and try to limit your exposure to PFAS um, as much as possible. Uh, so uh, I'll be a guinea pig uh, as we see how it works to uh, actually get another test done. I'm gonna already uh, have picked out a couple different treatment um, options, the reverse osmosis. So I'll probably be buying those, see how if we can get those installed and see how well those work as well. Uh, so that will be kind of the information that we'll be trying to learn as we go on to help people be able to make good decisions about, you know, how can they protect their public health going forward uh, with this testing. Uh, the other thing I wanted to just let you know for the test kits uh, is so we brought some with us today. Um, so if you do want to buy one, we'd love to uh, sell you one for $60. Uh, that helps us cover uh, at least some of the costs. They're still kind of at a loss because we uh, did try to raise uh, money to lower it as much as we possibly could. Uh, also, we have some flyers. So if you want to take them to friends and family, that would be great. Uh, in addition, I just want to thank some of the people that funded uh, the program. So we have the Charlevoix County Community Foundation, the Petoskey Harbor Springs Area Community Foundation, the Fry Foundation, uh, the Great Lakes uh, Energy People Fund, as well as uh, some individual donors as well. So if you get your money, or if you get your energy from Great Lakes Energy, they have an opportunity where you can round up your bill every month, and then that extra money goes to their People Fund, and then they give out grants. So as part of getting that money, we tell Great Lakes Energy that will let people know about that because it's really helpful. It was helpful for us. So uh, all that extra little contributions that you make then gets distributed to community so it can support these type of projects. So thank you. And if not, please sign up. It would really be helpful for all of us. Uh, just real quickly, a couple other things that we're going to be doing, I think, for education. We are uh, screening The Devil We Know, uh, which is kind of an eco-documentary about PFAS. And it tells the story about Parkersburg, West Virginia, where DuPont uh, helped create Teflon. And so the contamination with PFAS there. So it's a movie that talks about what happened in Parkersburg and PFAS from that point of view. So actually tonight it's gonna be shown in Muskegon at the uh, Fronthal Center, uh, but we're gonna be showing one probably in Charlevoix County uh, sometime this spring. So if you're interested in learning a little bit more about that, um, and hopefully we can have 
some of the same people here to just to kind of do a panel discussion as well as part of that. So stay tuned. I'm sure uh, the Watershed Council will uh, help us get the word out about that. And then if you are connected with a property owners association or a lake association and you'd like to help people get the word out for uh, the test kits, we'd appreciate that as well. And let us know. We can provide uh, an article that you could put in your newsletter or something else. Uh, in addition, we're also hoping to continue to work with partners throughout the state and at the federal level to see if we can get that drinking water standard um, adopted and one that is lower than 10, preferably. Uh, five would be uh, about right, but it might need to be lower, but we could start there as a good starting point. So is there anything I missed, Kate? Sounds like all. Okay, so I think we'll pass it with a date to yeah. talk a little bit more about how our drinking water data that we're collecting will then be combined with some of the work that uh, Dave's going to be doing uh, to learn more about what's happening in this area. Yeah, and as Ann alluded to, thanks to some wonderful help from local community foundations, we're going to take our programs that we do every three years, which is known as a comprehensive water quality monitoring program. We go out to a number of lakes and almost all of them in our service area. And uh, we'll be collecting a water sample and also a sediment sample at a majority of those locations at the same time we're doing that our, our own program. Uh, those samples then will go to Kate and then we'll be able to get an overview of our service area of yes or no, how much, and provide that information as a preliminary overview um, to if there are locations that need a second look, the DEQ can then provide some, some information or help in that manner. Um, one of the main aspects is that they don't have the, the resources to go out to a lot of the areas that we can uh, in a readily fashion, so this will help provide some information for them as well. What I'd like to do real quick here is just is show you the MPART website and talk about where to find information for the surface water that's been done already around the state. And so as you notice, I've highlighted in 2001, that's when the first testing was done in some of the areas. Uh, 21 sites were located and, and tested for PFOA and PFOS. And then since then, if there was uh, high contaminated areas, they did some follow-up activities. And the only main areas that have been really focused on, as, as Jen alluded to in the beginning, because of drinking water, was the Clinton River area, the Flint River, and the Huron River. And if you could go to any of these locations there, we'll provide you a quick little map of the watershed, which is something that we can do as well for our monitoring program as once we get the results back, show you where we tested and what some of the levels were or non-detects were. Um, and the city of Ann Arbor as well, the surface water in the Huron River, as you can see these values, middle 20s and, and in one location near 40 parts per trillion. Um, so this is a wonderful resource that we can go to and it provides a nice little detailed timeline of when they did the testing, how much was found, and when, when will it be done again. In terms of our service area, real quickly I just would like to show some areas that we're going to be considering in Emmett and Charlevoix County, which are the blue dots. Those are our comprehensive water quality monitoring programs where we are initially looking to um, collect some samples. Now we are in the process of, of nailing down specifically if this is a good site or a bad site and we're doing that in reference to some of the information that we have provide, been provided from the government agencies about uh, locations of interest. So it's a really important to note here that none of these have been identified as yes or no. It's just a matter of can we use this information to get an idea of what's in our area. We, we have no idea. So, um, so what we'll be doing this spring is as soon as ice comes off the lakes, we'll take our boats, go out, collect a water sample just in the middle of the, uh, middle of the lake and the substrate, the sediment at the bottom of the lake, get the results, and hopefully all is good and there's nothing to be found. But Will that information be available to us? Or? We can, yes, we will be with the community foundations as well. Yep. Okay. So I think with that, we'll be happy to take any questions from any part portions of the program today. Yes. Hi, uh, Dave. I haven't read uh, much technical literature regarding this topic, but in one of the newspaper articles, it was stated that if you sample surface water, you will always find it. Okay. Is that a correct statement, number one, and why? If it is, if it is, is why would you always find it? 
That's a wonderful question that I don't know. I haven't read that. It was in one of the newspaper articles. In okay. The, you know, my, my specific uh, in interest is Charlevoix. You know, the reason that we sh we're showing some is we have a surface water intake. Mm -hmm. okay? And that's where our drinking water is different than, than most of the others in Northwest Michigan. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm wondering why. Yeah. Well, they are persistent, and, and if they're in the water, they tend to they will stay there. Um, some are hydrophilic and some are hydrophobic, <coughs> hence why we're trying to do both sediment and uh, water. So uh, that's a great do question. Do you know Larry. if that's a correct statement? I, I don't know. Okay. Well, but I would just add, I think that's why this testing is so important too, Larry, because we don't know, right? There's so little known. So if you know, the Watershed Council can get some good information and they find it in every surface water sample and then they have a sediment sample to go with it and they can see what that concentration is. I think that's going to help us learn so much. And then we can look at where there are, if there's any, hopefully we'll have some well sampling nearby those locations as well that we can map. Uh, as long as people agree to let us use their data, we will do that and then we can learn even more about how that might be moving from land to water or water to land. I had a question for Ann. Mm -hmm. So when you got your sample mm -hmm. and then you bought drinking water, did you analyze No, so that's a good question. So we just yeah. talked yeah. about that. Yeah. So um, we talked about that at the office yesterday. So we're going to do some uh, bottled water sampling too because um, we know that from even in one Nestle's wells, they have some PFAS in one of their wells as well. Um, it's not high, but it still is there. Um, so the question is, is you don't really know when you go to find that alternative source whether that's a safe source either. Right. So uh, yeah, so we're gonna do like we have Colligan at our office. You know, it's sitting in plastic bottles. Do those bottles have a coating on the inside? So you know, they're they're really good questions, and we don't know the answers either. But we did talk about that, so we'll do uh, some of those other samples too, so we can start to learn more. So if you have ideas for that, please feel free to share them. Mm -hmm. I'll let you guys do. You can do the questions. No. And <laughs> oh, okay. oh, sorry. Go ahead. Um, well, they they've said before you do not microwave in a plastic container. Right. So temperature. I mean, obviously, then then you get from PFAS from the plastic into the food if you do that, or if you leave a a bottled water in the sun. Does the heat does the heat sometimes play the into it? Heat can make it a little more um, soluble. It will go into whatever the food can it is. Can leach or, into it? Right. So when you heat it up. Um, the the water's more willing to accept it. So Okay, so then if yeah, you if you're using using glass here. containers for like microwaving and is better. But so pottery or anything like that with any kind of a glaze or anything like that would there um, I don't know would that create leaching problems? Contain PFAS? Um, I well, think I, you, you were talking chrome plating, so I'm thinking plating anything is probably not good. Glass, cast iron. Um, Glass, cast iron are going to be clean for, for PFAS. Okay. Um, so it's mainly the plastics you have to worry about in the microwave, which I mean already okay. usually don't want to put plastics in the microwave too long. Okay. So just to tag on, there are a number of live wells, um, artesian wells for yes. people in the community, mostly North Clement yep. ish regularly fill all of their drinking water. Have those Are those on your radar to test? I thought of that because I thought, well, maybe I should right grab that jug and right fill it at a Lansing because right I go so right <laughs> past. And then I thought, um, well, maybe I should test them too. But yes. But there are two, Part three. Maybe more? And even Harbor, right? Yeah. Harbor, yes. all the ones in Harbor so Springs. And, and yeah. people regularly fill <coughs> jugs. So mm -hmm. I'm just. It's a good idea. I'll put, get a kit today from Kate and we'll fill that yeah. one up. When it comes to the cleanup, say you, you filter, you know, you said some of these get caught in the filter. Uh, then what happens to them? Um, Is okay. there any way to destroy <laughs> these things? PFAS at above a certain temperature will break down, and so you can incinerate them, and that will break down the PFAS compounds. Um, 
as far as I know, that is the process, but if you're throwing it into the landfill, then you have other problems because it can leach back out, so it does need to be disposed of properly. But, but there's also concerns with emissions, with um, the incineration of right. PFAS. So, um, the, uh, yeah, I'm working in Lansing with a large group of people and trying to come up with disposal options is extremely difficult because there's not a good disposal option for a lot of them. So this is another example of how our cleverness got us into some really deep trouble. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. So Jen, do you know anything about the MSU study where they were breaking it up, the grad students were breaking up the particles, they were spinning it so much? Mm -hmm. So there's some MSU study that is showing a way where they can centrifuge it somehow so they, they just put a whole bunch of energy in and break it up and then it, they're able to get rid of it. So that's promising, but it's very new. So does it get moved around by evaporation? If you've got a contaminated body, water, water evaporates, does that get carried up or does it stay where it is? Some can. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, I always have to remind myself, we were talking about 4,000 different types of materials. So. Mm -hmm. Some of volatile. Yes. So, so we, we ingest PFAS through our food or for drinking water. Does it also come in from our skin surface, like in a lake? It, it can, but very. It, that's not of concern. Um, the, the levels you're going to be exposed to are significantly low compared to um, what you would drink. Okay, a lot of water. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, they're not, there'll be no advisories from actually swimming in lakes that have PFAS in it. Now there is some foam that is showing up in certain water bodies that has high concentrations of PFAS. Um, they're recommending to not let particularly your pets, like your dog, go and play in it because they will most likely drink it. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that would be the concern with lakes. Um, but at the same point in time, we also have naturally occurring foam up here <laughs> on our lakes. So, um, thank you. So, what about our fire extinguishers? Do we just assume there's PFAS in them? No, it's a certain type of firefighting mm -hmm. foam. It's a triple F foam, um, and fire extinguishers do not have it. You're, you should be okay with your fire extinguisher. Tell me about the carry-out food thing. Containers, like I've seen different containers out there for a restaurant. What? Yeah, so um, it's in a, it has historically, and it probably still is in a lot of the carry-out containers. Now, as we move to more of the compostable and biodegradable, um, I don't believe it's in those, but I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but it's, yeah, it, I mean, any of the wrappers, anything you get from any of the fast food restaurants, the um, pizzas, the... Um, again, microwave popcorn, Chinese takeout, um, all of that sort of plastic material. Um, and then again, it, it's warm, which often then means it's some of that PFAS is getting into the food, which then you're ingesting. So she was asking the styrofoam. Is the styrofoam a problem? I don't know. Good question. I think that and some of the compostable ones, so that would be good to know. So, yeah. to see if we can learn that. Sure about the styrofoam. Well, styrofoam you can't recycle yet. So, you got to throw it away into the landfill. There's, there's also a question of water treatment plants. Mm -hmm. their, ex, their expulsion of whatever treated water that they have. Mm -hmm. You know, is that being addressed at this point, or is that in the future, you know, to find out what they're excreting into the uh, into the streams, into the lakes? Yeah, so the DEQ asked all of the wastewater treatment plants in Michigan um, to voluntarily test and see what they are discharging. Um, and so some of them now um, are 
have put in filters um, because of the levels. But for example, down in here on River, um, they actually went and found the source of the PFAS and it was a plating facility that actually hasn't used PFAS in about 10 or 15 years, but because they are so pervasive and they stay around, um, that it's still um, getting into the river and getting into the wastewater treatment plant. Um, but so they worked with the actual source to control the source as well as put in filters to try and limit what was being and they went out straight in other words but mm -hmm. um so locally speaking we've had a plating plant here in Petoskey that whole thing has been kind of swept under the rug um, it's, it's been a big concern of the people that live there mm -hmm. and they don't have wells they have city water but it shut down the wells in Petoskey and they went to Bay Harbor to get water mm -hmm. the city of Petoskey did mm -hmm. so there's a, a whole big trail of things that are not really being exposed here in Petoskey and I'm just wondering you know just how far that non-exposure part really goes it's you know is it really being recognized as a problem I noticed that we didn't have anything in Emma County that that was a concern you know? and as far as what's been identified by the state which is why we've chosen to do some of our own sampling and Again, we have the plating facility as well as other potential um, contaminated sites that we'll be, you know, trying to sample around those. Right. Um, we're looking for sites, obviously, that we think might be contaminated with PFAS. Um, yeah, I mean, some of us, if you've lived here any length of time, you realize what's been going on here for generations. And back then it was not a concern, but now we have the means to detect things. Mm -hmm. I think the more we get it out there in the public's eye, then the safer the people in this area will be at least. Yeah, and we're coordinating mm -hmm. with the state as well. They know what we're doing. Um, and, you know, if we come up with positive heads, that can also engage the state and bring them in. Um, you know, and I'm also coordinated with emergency manager and the EPA, and we're all talking about, you know, PFAS and what is potentially here and what is coming down the pike, so. Yeah, well, it's, and, it's important, you know, for everybody that lives here. I mean, there's most of the things I see on the board or on the wall are, you know, industrial areas in the state of Michigan, downstate mostly. Mm -hmm. Uh, we like to keep our water clean up here too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is the plating place is that okay. the one that's near the Bear River? And so it was, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. sure. so that might, I mean, so I think when Dave looks at his Bear River sites, that could be mm -hmm. probably. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the old Tannery Creek out on, on Iowa. Uh, right. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah that would be a good one too. Mm -hmm. What kinds of support are we seeing from our local legislators? Um, Sue Aller has been very supportive of this. Um, she's very engaged on PFAS. So she has Ward Smith Air Force Base in her district. <laughs> um, so she has one of the big sites uh, that's contaminated. So she is working on legislation. Um, I have not heard anything from um, Representative Chatfield or Cole um, or Senator Schmidt. Um, that doesn't mean they won't be supportive, it just means they haven't been uh, proactive on the issue. Um, mostly the proactive ones are the ones that are dealing with um, the big sites that have, have been identified by the state. A lot of the, the downstate representatives, um, Parchment and Rockford, um, Ann Arbor, I, I, I noticed that the Kalamazoo River wasn't on that either, on your map there, after that big oil spill was from the Enbridge mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. That's the, the petroleum part of it doesn't really show up in this type of a test. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, that's another question I have for Kate. Are you testing for anything other than PFAS? Not from these samples. No. Okay. So they're all PFAS. 
do you have the ability to expand what you're testing for? That as far as mercury, lead? Uh, right, so we do have a, a lead or heavy metals testing program okay. as well, and we do have the capability to test for those um, if there were interests we could. Uh, it would take a different sample, so we have to keep them separate because we preserve them different ways, but oh, okay. um, we could analyze for those as well in the future if they were interested. How effective are the um, reverse osmosis and charcoal filters in, in removing these type of chemicals? From what I've seen, the reverse osmosis is I think one of the most effective forms. The charcoal is sporadic, so there is breakthrough of chemicals. Um, but it is the cheaper and easiest to replace option. Um, Tim Fabrica is very supportive of a resin, an ion resin, in order to remove it. I don't know what the cost is for that though. Um, and so I really am supportive of the reverse osmosis at the moment because it does have the capability to remove short chains as well as long chains. Any, so any, any system has to be maintained properly. Yeah. Right. So if you're going to get a filter, it has to, you have to maintain it and replace filters. And <laughs> that's an important thing. It can't just be put in once and forgotten about. I just have a question as consumers then, what are some things that we can do? I mean, we've known about Teflon pans for a long time, but they still are being sold. Mm -hmm. Certainly bottled water and plastic containers. I mean, what can we do? Well, I mean, I think the first step is really education, right? So being aware of that, right? So then what are, how can you limit your exposure as much as possible? So when you're making those choices to cook, you know, what are you going to use? Try to use the, the glass and the, the cast iron uh, and metal instead of the things that are coated. Uh, you know, you're not going to completely be able to eliminate your exposure to it. I think even from, you know, it's like waterproof stuff, you know, you can't necessarily get away with it get away from using it but if you have an old Gore-Tex coat that's starting to have rips and tears well then maybe that's time to retire that one and get a new one that isn't going to be sloughing off some new dust that you would be inhaling so I think you know the first step is just understanding it and I think then it's still kind of new and we're still learning so I think that's the first thing um, then the next thing is you know making sure what you're ingesting with your water is safe and then I think it's uh, helping to share that information with others, as well as then making sure that we can support these actions that will keep us safer moving forward. And then hopefully in the next year or two, we'll keep learning more, right? So then we'll know more, better ways that we can keep ourselves safe. And there haven't been yet any health, negative health impacts from this, right? Well, I think if, I mean, I haven't heard this, the stories in person, but I know others have, and I don't know if you've heard, but, you know, some of the, some of the residents in Rockford, um, in particular, have, have had some pretty severe, you know, health, you know, there's been some deaths, and people think that it's related to that. Now, can you prove that? I don't really know, um, but, you know, they're heartbreaking stories, and I think the same with Parkersburg, West Virginia, and some of the other communities. Um, that have had you know very very high concentrations of this in their community so i do think the health effects are there i mean i think then it's how do we as a society move forward so we can protect public health and not make ourselves sick from products so on one of the previous slides there was a little box with the amount contained in fish in a lake who's monitoring that the DEQ, the DEQ is monitoring fish, and in their, um, and they put out a Eat Safe Fish Guide annually um, that has safe levels of fish to eat for PFAS as well as mercury and the other contaminants that are in um, our waters. But they're the ones doing the testing of the fish. And they're taking samples from the rivers and streams, lakes, mm -hmm. all over. Mm -hmm. Yep, or anglers will request a sample from them. Any other questions? So, so maybe the follow-up would be the if we're going to have PFAS filtering 
Where do you go with all the filters, the coats, the shoes? <laughs> the coats, That's a good question. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're just talking with? about that. Is yeah. our recycling program? Right? Yeah. 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 You know, I mean, does our recycling program recognize the EFOS yet? Or? Uh, no. I mean, we have the best recycling program in the state. We do. Yeah. So, you know, mm -hmm. the gal that runs it is really good. So, I don't know, you know, if she's catching wind of all this or, or what's going on, but it would be nice to have a container or something other that you put PFAS filters at least in mm -hmm. so it doesn't get put into the landfill and we see it again in our next two or three generations, you know? Yeah, that's, that's right. That's actually so really good. We can <laughs> certainly talk to the Emmett County Recycling. Um, we can follow up on that. Yeah, I think she's pretty receptive. She's been really good so far. I mean, other than styrofoam, we can recycle pretty much everything. Yeah. And again, disposal is certainly an issue that um, the state and everyone's going to have to uh, grapple with. So, but we can certainly talk to the county and see if we can come up with at least a solution locally for us. Yeah, and I, I think it's a great question. I mean, we talked, somebody brought that up in our office too. What do we do with the filters when we're done? We don't know the answer, so I think it's important to know that too. Yeah. I mean, I know this is brand new, but the more we think full cycle of it, mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. the better chance we got of maybe containing it at least a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, well, thank Any you. Any other questions? Yeah.